Welcome back to Making a Murderer, my journal. And we're on the second part of the series where we're going down the rabbit hole with the three unsolved homicides for Manitowoc County. Um, let's recap part one real quick, just briefly. Please watch it if you really want to know what's going on or none of this is really going to make sense. But the recap is that we went through and found out that Zellner had talked to Barb and Scott Tadich and were asking about Carmen's ashes. And it has been agreed upon from the family that they will release Carmen Botwell's ashes to be tested against the remains found in the Avery case. And the fact that that's even being a comparison that we're seeing if the seven Loki actually match Carmen Botwell's ashes is huge. So let's let's look into that scenario um with teresa Hawbach, um one of the things i noticed was that her boss had mentioned and this is a calmat county sheriff's department report and it states thomas now this is thomas pierce tom pierce and that was her green bay um pierce photography was her boss and he wrote thomas indicated teresa told him that she was going to leave auto trader right around halloween and that Teresa told her auto trader clients about this. Thomas stated that was approximately two to three weeks before Teresa went missing. How would she possibly have decided to leave auto trader at exactly the time that she goes missing? So, Selner has refuted this. Teresa's mother, Karen Halbach, first reported Teresa missing at 2.52 p.m. on November 3rd, 2005. And the reason we say that is because look at this. This is the incident report. And I know it's blurry. Sorry about that. It shows the create time 11-3-2005, 2.51 p.m. So just a few minutes after the reported missing Teresa Halbach, they have it now as an incident type of death. And it's put out that... Um, this is actually a death that has occurred on the 3rd. But we we only know of one death that occurred on the 3rd of November. And that was at 8.30 a.m. And that was Carmen Botwell. So if we are just talking about a missing girl, how are they getting death at 11.305 on this report? And then it goes out into the mainstream of the, um, I believe this is the Global Subject Report, which is, um, you know, worldwide. And it shows again the same information, 11-3-2005, only it changes the time to 6.34 p.m. And then it lists the subject. And it says, Incident Report, Homicide, Non-Neglect Charges. So he was actually brought up on charges within just a few hours or even minutes of her missing. And so I want to dig into the death certificate and find out what are the questions that we have with this document and what does it give us for actual information. And I, I noted that this was a headline in the news as well. Making a murder, Teresa Halbach's death certificate slammed as deeply flawed after new details emerge. And it says, spoiler alert, Teresa Halbach's death certificate offers up a number of clues that campaigners claim point to Steve Avery being framed. All right. So for those of you that have not had a chance to sit down and review this document, this is indeed Teresa Halbach's death certificate. You can see right there, it's Teresa M. Halbach, and um, it is a death certificate. And we're going to dig into it. It's a little blurry, so let's go ahead and do some close-ups. So one of the main things that brought my attention is that these boxes are numbered. And if you look down here at this one um, that I boxed out with the red, you're going to see that the funeral service licensee signed. What are they signing for? They're not even getting a body. And the bones aren't going to be released. They have to go be identified. They have not even at this point been identified as human or female or anything really. Nothing legit. There's no hard copy that those bones are even real. There's no documentation where they were found. So why is a funeral home signing off? Now, here's the question. November 10th, 2005. 
This is when, remember, in part one, where we read that Eisenberg, the one that it counted, that that's when the, the evidence was entered on the bones? Before that, we don't know where the bones came from, and it's just hearsay. But up until she gets it on the 10th, and this is the 10th. All right. Interesting. Let's look at this one. Was the body found? No. Okay. Well, at least they're honest about it. But yet, if you look down here on the bottom box, autopsy performed? Yes. How? How did you perform even an autopsy on no body? I do not understand that. If there is no body, you cannot perform an autopsy. There was a box there that said no right beside it. No autopsy performed, but it's not checked. However, somebody has already made a note here where it says, it's asking about, enter the discussion, something, uh, injuries or complication that caused the death, okay? And on A, 38A says undetermined and it's crossed off. So on the 10th, they had already determined her death, but they didn't list it. They didn't list what her death was. They just said, it's not undetermined. We're just on the death certificate, the final document. We're not going to list how it happened. Why? Is it because you didn't have a body? No, you didn't. All right. Where did you store the non-existent body? In a temporary storage, Calumet County Medical Examiner. So I'm guessing these are the bones. That's what I'm guessing. The temporary storage, I'm going to guess, I'm going to venture out on a leaf and say is the cardboard box. I don't know what you think, but that's what I think. And I think that's the partial autopsy that they did is the bones. But what I find interesting is in part one, we've already established that Carmen's cremation happened at one after 1.30 p.m. on the 8th and that nobody that matters has seen these bones until the 10th. Also, date pronounced dead, November 10th, 2005. Why'd we pick that date? That seems strange. Um, that's a very specific date. Um, it's the date that the medical examiner, which is actually a certified nursing um, anesthesiologist, and that would be Michael um, Glazer, and he signed it on December 5th, 2005. So the first time somebody that's actually of um, quality to, you know, not quality, but um, has authority to sign the document, doesn't even sign it till the 5th of December. But it's still entered in the court on November 10th, 2005. And how do we know that? Oh, wait, let's back up. So look right here where Michael signed his physician license number. Zero 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 eight. That's not his license number. So this is um, this death certificate does not even have a legal medical license number attached to it. I looked him up. I looked at his credential license number. It is six two nine four eight dash thirty, not zero 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 eight. And he's a registered nurse. He's an anesthesiologist, actually, for Calumet County. But he's not just licensed to this state. He can travel. Um, but I'm, I've got to the edge of this death certificate. And you can see two things got filed here. We have a filing um, from the plaintiff where it got put into evidence on the plaintiff's exhibit, 12605. And then also we have the sheriff department, um, or the state actually filed it on the 6th of December as well. Oddly, the form was completed and signed six weeks before it was even corrobor corroborated by the FBI that the DNA was linked to Halbach. So no proof of death, no proof of identification at all on the bones, and they've already got that death certificate made and signed November 10th and then December 5th. And it was signed off on the 6th of December, the same day Stephen Avery's preliminary trial began. The medical examiner has also crossed off the box that says no body was found, even though it claims to have completed the autopsy. According to historical reports, 
Bones belong to, uh, to Halbach, the 25-year-old freelance photographer who disappeared October 31, 2005, were found in a burn pit and two other locations over an 11-day period after she went missing. So that would put her 11-11-2005 before they actually had enough of the bones together to actually make any type of judgment. However, her death certificate records the date of her death as 10th of November. Stop right there. That'd be one day short of actually having the bones that we need to actually send them through, let alone that we don't even have identification yet from the FBI or even from the state crime lab. The crime lab hasn't even touched the box. It's still on Eisenhower's desk and uh, on the 10th. Remember, she said she was looking at the bones. So the same day she looks at the bones, she hands them over to this medical examiner. He doesn't sign it till the 5th or 6th of December. Okay, continue. Meaning that not all of the evidence could have been collected in this time frame. Police found Halbach's charred remains in, let's back up, alleged Halbox charred remains in a burn barrel along with her mobile phone situated near Avi's trailer. The cert was also written six weeks before the bones were positively identified as Hallbox on January 19th. These dates are important because Steve Avery was charged with murder on November 9th, and in order to do that, there must be proof of death. So it seems like the paperwork on Hallbox's death certificate was pushed through improperly, so charges could be laid, reads the report. The day of the cert is also significant. They claim because Dist District Attorney Dennis Vogel and Sheriff Tom I can never say his name. I'm just going to call him Tom. <laughs> We're both due to um, be deposed on November 10th and respectively on the 15th. How convenient that this all falls along the same timeline. They don't even know at this point whose bones they are or if they're human. They just know they have bones. And they went ahead and they filled out a death certificate and gave it to the Halbach family. So let's talk about... Mr. Bushman. Um, he was the group leader. Now, remember, Bushman's the one that has the wife that owns the um, funeral home, the Pfeiffer funeral home that Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department just took her there and guided and told the family, this is what we're doing. We're cremating Carmen Botwell, and it's going to be done by Pfeiffer. Okay? Now, why? Because <laughs> oof, Mike Bushman's wife owns that. Now, remember, he's going to come onto this property on the 7th, and then the next day, all the bones are going to be found. Well, not all, but a lot of the bones are going to be found, supposedly. But yet, they don't hit Dr. Eisenberg's desk till the 10th. So, let's go ahead and read this. Retired. So, he's actually not... Uh, stop right there. Sorry. He is not even supposed to be working. He's from Manitowoc County. He's coming out of retirement. When we cannot allow the coroner on the property because Manitowoc County is saying that there could be some conflict of interest for her. So they threaten to arrest her if she gets on the corner on the Avery property. But they're more than happy for Bushman to stop by out of retirement on the 7th and spend the entire day there. Let's go with this. So. Retired Deputy Bushman was group leader. Oh, he gets a big part, right? He's going to be the leader of the MTSO officers, including Bonefinder Just, who discovered the cell phone barrel the morning of the 7th and not one of the Casio department or deputy anywhere in sight. So here we go. It's um, the MTSO Deputy Cider's testimony, day six, and it's uh, page 149. Answer, myself along with Sergeant Scott S. and Deputy Mike Bushman and Sergeant Jason Jost responded to Avery Road, where there would be Avery Salvage Yard to assist Calmette County Sheriff's Department searching the property. Question, what were your responsibilities upon arrival at the scene? Answer, we were to make contact with the officer in charge at the scene to get daily duties. Question, okay, were you given specific job that day? Answer, we were informed by the OIC officer in charge to get in search groups. The search group I was, oh, I'm sorry, I was in was search group A. Our team leader of the search that group was Deputy Mike Bushman of the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Deputy Department. 
boom. The gentleman that was the original arresting officer for Steve Avery is now in charge of finding the bones and looking for the evidence. His wife owns the funeral home, the Pfeiffer funeral home, His her, her family does, where they've cremated Carmen. Okay, what happened to team leader deputy? Okay, here's that sign in and out log. This was Bushman's Day, signed in at 7.30 a.m. with Todd Herman. That's a brother to the sheriff at the time. Out at, nobody signed out. In again at 12.50. Out at, who knows. In at 4.15 uh, p.m. Out at 4.45 p.m. In at, sometime. Out at 5.33 p.m. According to Dietering Report, in the Casio page 137, by 10.35 p.m., retired MTSO Deputy Inspector Mike Bushman had discovered a possible burial site over at Cuss Road, which tied up the other Casio officers over on Cass or Cuss Road. Wow. All right. Who were the Casio officers with these MTSO deputies during the cell phone burial discovery or barrel discovery? There was 24 Casio officers signed in during the time frame that the barrel was found. Also on the property was Ryan Hilligus and Scott Blodorn in a 9.03 a.m. and out at 9.53 a.m. Not only does Siders fail to mention with uh, which Casio officers were on his team, not one Casio officer writes a report on the cell phone burial discovery. Just like the bones, there is absolutely not one, one report filed on a major case like this. Um, let's see here. Uh, at approximately 1.15 p.m., oh, this is Jouse talking. He says, at approximately 1.15 p.m., I was requested to stand by the garbage burn barrel at Steve Avery's house until evidence technicians arrived on scene. I did stand by with this until approximately 3.39 p.m. when the barrel was removed by Calumet County Sheriff's Department Deputy Ken Matsu something. So we're looking at the day before Carmen's cremated. And we're looking at the day before the bones are found. And they find the cell phone and such. Wow. So at this point, let's recap. We have Bushman on Cuss Road with all of the um, experts over there away from the property. We've got Ryan Heligas and Blodorn, Scott Blodorn, on the actual property of Avery's. Who's watching them? Joust with the barrel? Really? You're kidding me. So here's what Jell says. Sergeant Jell started to pick up on all this information together. I felt this area, if not already looked at, should be checked for any type of evidence. Hmm. So Joust, who was with Bushman from the beginning, he's the one that's left behind watching the barrel and finds, finds the stuff while his buddy is over there on Cuss Road with all the experts. So we've got Joust and we've got um, Ryan Heligas and we've got Scott Blordone all over there on Avery's property with nobody watching. Got it. I follow. Okay, November 7th, 2005, at 10.35 a.m., retired Deputy Inspector Mike Bushman of MTSO was leading a team searchers in the area at the end of Cuss Road, approximately one half mile from the western edge of Avery property, when he found a possible excavation site. Casio Report, page 137. According to Tyson, it was a three by three feet area of disturbed soil. Teetering is called to the scene and the area taped off and no one allowed in or out. Tyson is called away from Barb's to the suspicious scene on Cuss Road. And when he clears, then returns to Barb's, despite Tyson's clearing of the scene, Earl of Wisconsin Crime Lab is called away from searching the Janda burn barrels at Cassio to Cuss Road, where he finds. And this is what he says. This is what Earl of Wisconsin Crime Lab, the state guy. An area with disturbed soil, to me, it didn't look like a gravesite. It looked more like a rotten stump to me, where the wood had just turned into, like, hummus. There were no plants growing up through it, really, so it was a barren spot, so it kind of looked like it was disturbed. 
This looks like a distraction, a redirection to me. Is that what Bushman did? I'm just asking. Did he redirect everybody onto Gus Road and leave um, the three bad boys over there? Good question. During the crucial 48 hours after the Rev4 is discovered, more than half a day is wasted in Bushman's rotten stump. Take key personnel away from the AV property in the burn barrel surge. For more of a detailed timeline on November 7th, okay, you could read that. Um, the next day, 2008, 2005, cremains found in the fire pit, license plates found in the car on the path, close to Steve Avery's trailer, burn barrel discovered by Steve's trailer, key is found in Steve's trailer, bones, teeth found. So, bam! Bushman distracts everybody on to the road on the 7th. And then you've got Joust over there looking through burn barrels with Ryan, who's a nurse, by the way, and Scott Blordon. And then the next day, everything comes together. We get the um, cremains in the fire pit, lace, the license plate, burn barrel full of uh, the electronics, and we find the key in the trailer and the bones and the teeth. Big day. So who is Deb here? She is Manitowoc, or was Manitowoc County's coroner. And she has some things to say about the Teresa Halbach case. She learned of the suspect human bones off of the television watching the news instead of the coroner being called. This type of death by the state statute should have triggered the coroner's involvement. Her deputy coroners contact her to ask about the case after seeing it on television. She immediately contacts a fellow forensics anthropologist and forensics pathologist and advises them that they've got work to do at the scene as part of the death investigation. After two or three calls to Mark Weger, November 9th, wondering why she hadn't been called to the scene yet, he said she would have to check, or he would have to check, then said her services weren't needed. Days after the bone discovery removal, Dan Fisher, County Executive of Manitowoc County, also told her not to push being involved as there was a conflict of interest. All right. Deb Kay disagreed with Fisher's stance. It was highly unusual to get a call from the county executive at all. Later, she received another call from Stephen Rollins, Manitowoc County Corporation Counsel, to likewise advise, advise that she should not be involved because of the purported conflict of interest. But Bushman wasn't a conflict? The original arresting officer? Okay, sure. So these are the bones that, uh, on the 10th, the first time that we actually see a box of bones and this was photographed um, the day that Mrs. Eisenberg got a hold of them. So you can see here there's a box on the right side. Those are funeral home bones after a cremation before it goes through the grinder. Now look at the trial bones. The only difference to me is that we've got serious burning on them. So let's go. Funeral home are, okay, this is Carmen Botwell. We're going to go back here. It explains that her funeral service will be held at 1 p.m. Tuesday, November 8, 2005. It tells the church. All right, so we have that date. And we know that at 1 p.m., after 1.30, they're actually sent her away to cremate her. So how could her bones be found on the 8th before she's cremated? Let's go back and review this one more time, folks. The bones were found on November 8th, delivered to Eisenberg's office. She says November 9th. Eisenberg had been gone over the weekend, and her first day back to work was November 10th, which was Thursday, by the way. That was more than the weekend, my dear. Here is her testimony on direct by Felon. A, um, when I open the box uh, on Thursday, November 10th at Dane County Coroner's Office Morgue, where I do most of my uh, laboratory work, um, I open the box to find many uh, blackened, highly fragmented, and incomplete human bone fragments. Let me ask you this, folks. I'm just going to say it. Carmen was cremated at one thirty. It takes two and a half hours to cremate bones. And if they're not going to go ahead and grind them after, they're done. You say, well, what if the bones were hot? We don't know who got the bones during that time. There's no documentation they even existed. All we were told is that bones were found. And look at who we're working with. Whose word are we having to trust? Bushman's, whose family owns the crematory in the funeral home that Carmen was cremated in. He was the original arresting officer in 1985 with Stephen Avery. 
And he's also been the one that investigated, was the lead investigator in the Ricky Hoshletter hit and run in 1999. And everybody claims he dropped the ball on purpose. So let's go over this one more time on this. Could November 10th actually be on this death certificate more in line with the bones that came from that nursing home? I'm sorry, funeral home? Could those be Carmen's bones? In theory, yeah, they could. Was there a body found? No, there wasn't. But if they have her bones, look here. Undetermined. They don't know because she's bones. <sighs> this case, it's killing me. So remember when I told you Carmen wore glasses, but Teresa didn't? Item seized from Avery property. I know it's blurry because it's an actual archive of the newspaper. Broken pair of eyeglasses. Why were they in evidence with the charred remains from the barrel? They're listed right next to it. A pair of eyeglasses. Well, maybe, maybe they were Earl's. No, because he had his glasses after he broke them. Well, a lot of people say, well, they were probably Jody's glasses. She said she may have broke a pair. Really? Because she doesn't seem to remember details very well at all. Her story changes quite frequently. We've all seen that. And there's too many lies to just assume. They put these glasses in evidence. Why aren't DNA done on them? So that we can find out whose glasses they are. That could be very helpful. So, depending on location, the crematory process can take anywhere from 3 to 15 business days. Now, that's if you do it legal. Because it says some states have laws requiring a waiting period before cremation cremation can take place. The actual cremation can take about three hours, and processing the cremation remains takes another one to two hours. So three hours on from one thirty, they get there at two, they do it till five PM, let the bones cool. Next day, on the ninth, they let the bones cool completely, take them there in the evening, put them on Eisenhower's desk. On the 10th, she shows up. There are the bones. How long does crematory process take? Depends on the size of the individual and the type of cremation container. Typically, typically the process takes about two hours at a normal operation temperature of 1,600 to 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Cremated remains are commonly referred to as ashes. However, in reality, they consist primarily of bone fragments. It is important to recognize that the cremated remains of the body are commingled with any remains of the container as well as any incidental byproducts of the incineration. Really, I wonder if the jeans that Carmen wore, that Carmen wore, might match those little daisy snaps, you know? Doesn't that kind of enter your mind? Anyway, let's get back to this. Um, it says that cremation produces three to nine pounds of remains, depending on the size of the body and the process issued by the crematory. Next, jewelry or other items that would like to keep are removed. Medical devices and prosthetics that are mechanical or contain batteries are removed. Stop there. That includes pacemakers, you guys, because they don't want that exploding in the crematory. So they do a lot of body removal parts to get to metal rods in the people and so forth. Um... Oh yeah, contains batteries are often removed. This is to prevent reaction during the crematory or cremation process. Items such as pins, screws, joints remain in place. Recycling policies for medical devices vary by facility, but in no case are these devices reused as is. There, they are disassembled, melted down, and disposed of in some other responsible method. Let's recap. Boy, I don't even know what to say. We have a really screwed up death certificate and we have the 10th and we have that dated the 10th of November that she's pronounced dead. Why would they have done that with Carmen? I'm sorry, with Teresa. But they might have done that with Carmen because she was cremated on the 9th. And... That leaves a lot of questions. It could very easily be why Zellner is questioning these ashes and where she wants to compare Carmen Botwell's ashes to the remains that are found on the Avery, uh, the Avery salvage yard could be because we might have a seven-loki match. 
And if we do, we might even have more of a match than seven. And if it turns out that we have a 13, well, there you go. And we know from looking at part one, they are related. Go back and read part, or watch part one. You'll understand that they have to be related because we have 13 stops. We only have like six names in between them. They're related. So very well could be the seven Loki. All right. Thank you so much for watching. Um, it's been a long day, but we do have one more part to go. This is going to tie in a lot of the Bushman and the Ricky Hutch-Stedler. I have a horrible time saying that name. Forgive me for that. Um, we're going to call him Ricky H. Um, but his hit and run and Bushman and ties right all into this whole scenario. It's like thicker than thieves. Um, it's all the king's men, all the king's horses, uh, you know, couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Yeah, so thanks for watching. Um, please hit that like button and subscribe if you want to keep up with the updates. Again, if you didn't do the crime, you shouldn't do the time. Have a good day. Bye.